Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to our Global Perspectives event this morning, uh, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be on uh, Ethiopian-Russian relations. I'm Matt Rojansky. Uh, I'm director of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. This is now our fifth installment of the Global Perspectives series, and I think we found it to be a, a really uh, unique and valuable model, and we're just thrilled to be partnering with the Africa program of the Wilson Center uh, for this event, and uh, particularly with my colleague, Mike Morrow, who's the Senior Diplomatic Fellow uh, in the Africa program, uh, and to be able to bring you uh, such an insightful uh, and expert uh, voice in Abel Abate, who uh, Mike will introduce in just a moment. He's an Associate Fellow in the Africa program at Chatham House. Um, before we start, I want to remind you, you can stay up to date with all of our uh, work and upcoming uh, events and publications on our website and follow our podcasts, Kenan X and The Russia File, uh, as well as our two blogs, also called The Russia File and Focus Ukraine. Um, if you want to ask a question at any point during today's discussion, please email kenan at wilsoncenter.org or tweet at Kenan Institute, K-E-N-N-A-N Institute, uh, or post on our Facebook page. So any of those will get through to us. If you include your name and affiliation, and you actually make it a question with a question mark, uh, it will make it much more likely that it will get through to me and uh, I will pass it along uh, to our speakers. So without further ado, let me introduce Mike, uh, who will open uh, with a few remarks and then hand it over to Abel. So uh, Mike Morrow is a senior diplomatic fellow uh, in the Africa program at the Wilson Center, which means he's detailed from the State Department where he is a senior foreign service officer uh, with the rank of minister counselor. Um, his incredibly wide-ranging uh, field experience includes serving as charge uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Juba, South Sudan from 2017 to 2018, before which uh, he served for six years uh, at the State Department in Washington as Chief of Staff to the Special Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition Countering ISIS, uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Legislative Affairs, uh, Director for East African Affairs, and Director for Central European Affairs. He also worked at the, at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad as Deputy Director and Director of the Office of Provincial Affairs uh, in 2010-11, and as a Principal Officer in the U.S. Consulate General in Chiang Mai, Thailand from 2007 to 10. His earlier Foreign Service postings have included the U.S. Embassies in Gaborone, Warsaw, Moscow, and Lagos, so really uh, interesting and diverse set of experiences. Uh, he has uh, supported the uh, crisis management uh, operations uh, center and has served as deputy director in the office of Russian affairs. Mike has a master's degree uh, in international affairs from Columbia and a uh, bachelor's in political science from Miami University. Um, I can't think of anyone more perfect actually to guide this conversation today, Mike. So I'm going to step out of the way and uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Matt, for that kind introduction. I'd like to start by giving a bit of context on Russia's presence in Africa uh, before we move on to our discussion on Ethiopia-Russia relations, which will be led by uh, Mr. Abel Abate, whom I'll introduce in, in a few moments. Uh, clearly, Russia's presence in Africa has expanded over the last few years. Uh, most notably, the 2019 Africa-Russia summit uh, played a large role in facilitating stronger political, cultural, and economic ties between Russia and African countries, especially in terms of renewing relations that had been severed after the Soviet Union's breakup in 1991. Uh, new ties are also being created by Russia and Africa. Trade between Russia and Africa is growing at a very fast rate, uh, doubling in the past five years to 20 billion annually, uh, though this is still below the share of trade held by other world powers such as the US and China. Uh, Russia is the largest arms supplier to the African continent, but Russia is broadening its economic uh, relations with African countries beyond arms sales in particular uh, by increasing its investments in oil, gas, and other natural resources. Russia is also reasserting its influence in Africa by enhancing its security presence in multiple ways. In addition to the arms sales, uh, Moscow is concluding security agreements and conducting military training, uh, in particular with uh, a number of unstable or autocratic states in Africa, such as the Central African Republic, uh, Libya, and Mozambique. 
One of Russia's uh, stated priorities in Africa is to advance regional peace and security. And this is a priority it shares with the United States. However, uh, given Moscow's and Washington's different histories and different approaches in Africa, it's, it's unlikely that the US and Russia will uh, significantly collaborate in this regard. Uh, for its part, uh, Russia has focused on giving African countries easier access to arms uh, with fewer constraints related to human rights, government transparency, and public opinion. As for the US, uh, the recent uh, the Trump administration's Africa strategy uh, had been focused on ensuring US business interests, building stronger economic ties, providing development assistance, and countering the influence of competitors, particularly Russia and China. As for the new Biden administration, uh, recent remarks by President Biden ahead of the 2021 AU summit uh, emphasized his commitment to investing in Africa's democratic institutions, responding to COVID-19 and tackling climate change. Whereas Moscow portrays its growing relations with Africa as mutually beneficial for all parties involved, uh, Washington often sees Russia's presence as a threat to good economic governance and the rule of law in Africa. Uh, in fact, the, the prevailing view from Washington is that Russia is strategically targeting certain areas of Africa to gain a competitive advantage over the, over the United States, particularly in regions where the US has uh, historically been heavily engaged. So for its part, Washington has been paying close attention and is working to counterbalance Russia's growing influence um, uh, across the African continent. So against this backdrop, I'd now like to introduce our featured speaker, Mr. Abel Abate. Uh, Mr. Abel will provide us with his expert views on Ethiopia-Russia relations to include some historical context and in particular focus on the Ethiopian perspective uh, on the pros and cons and the risks and rewards of its relationship with Russia. Since we only have an hour, uh, we want to keep the focus of our session and, and the, the follow-up Q&A session on the topic of Ethiopia-Russia Ethiopia relations and, and not delve into the internal domestic dynamics of either country, which are fascinating in their own right. So we're delighted to have with us today Mr. Abel Abate. He's an associate fellow of the Chatham House Africa program and also a researcher focusing on Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. Uh, Mr. Abel has served as political advisor for the British Embassy in Addis Ababa from 2015 to 2019. And before that, as a senior researcher and program head at the Ethiopia Foreign Relations Strategic Studies Institute from 2012 to 2015. And then since March of 2019, uh, Mr. Abel has been working for the Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy as its program manager for Ethiopia, uh, in addition to his um, uh, service with the uh, Chatham House. Abel has been published widely across international media outlets and in academic literature. We're delighted to have him with us today. So Mr. Abel, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael, for the kind introduction. Uh, Ethiopia and Russia uh, have uh, more than 120 years of diplomatic relationship. So one can talk a lot about uh, what has been going on actually in this relationship for the past many, many years. But uh, for the interest of time, I would like to focus on four important things which I deem are extremely important in analyzing and understanding the relationship between the bilateral relationship between the two countries. Uh, to begin with, uh, Ethiopia remains one of the most trusted partners for, for Russia, particularly in Africa. And this relationship has seen some ups and downs, uh, depending on the government, uh, the leadership between the two, within the two countries. But all in all, uh, the two countries have enjoyed cordial relationship throughout uh, uh, throughout more than a century uh, bilateral relationship. Uh, and for the interest of time, as I said earlier, on, let me focus on four, four important things. The first one is in analyzing the relationship, I think one thing stands out is both countries are ancient empires and plus modern day federations. So they have an extremely diverse population, uh, which in, in Russia, according to official figures show, 
there are more than 190 ethnic groups and in Ethiopia you have nearly 90 ethnicities. So they both have an extremely diverse uh, population in terms of ethnicity, in terms of language and also religion. So managing differences in both countries has always been a daunting task. The, uh, uh, whether a new government comes or goes, I think one of the most challenging issues for both governments is managing differences in this type of extremely diverse country. And uh, as of basically early 1990s, uh, both countries have had serious issues with regards to their sovereignty. Uh, several countries have gained independence from the, the USSR and Eritrea have also gained independence from Ethiopia. Even after that, uh, they both have actually an extremely diverse uh, population. And one thing that, that should be noted in this process is also actually the role of external factors in state building, in state crafting and nation building process is minimal in, compare, in comparison to many countries in the world. So the fact that both countries are ancient empires and a struggling modern day federations uh, uh, and the, the, their trial to manage differences uh, I think made them somehow similar. And the second one is the role of Marxism and, and Leninism as an ideology. So in Ethiopia, particularly uh, from 1974 uh, to 1991, when Ethiopia had a socialist military junta, uh, and even afterwards actually, when it was under the Ethiopian People Revolutionary Democracy Front from 91 to 2018, uh, the dominance of this ideology was clear to every policies, ideologies, and even the constitution. Uh, and I think that was also the case uh, for many parties uh, in the USSR, particularly, uh, even if that was changing pretty much after the Cold War period. So, and to, to, to give some highlight actually about the relationship, particularly in 1974, the relationship between the Dirk and the USSR was not uh, as such uh, cordial at the beginning. But when the Dirk have, uh, have did manage to get actually the support from the West, and when Somalia was not that much really a partner to, to, to USSR, I think uh, it's a pretty much uh, a matter of convenience for the two countries to, to, to engage in a much more cordial relationship. So throughout 1974 to 1991, tens of thousands of Ethiopians have been educated in the USSR universities. According to official figures, it reached to uh, around 30,000 uh, Ethiopians have studied in different Soviet universities. And the political and military advisors were also in Ethiopia as part of the bilateral relationship and the warming up of relationship between the two countries. And Russian literature is also becoming a most the more dominant uh, in Ethiopia's literature. And uh, the fact that uh, myth or whatever you call it, that Alexander Pushkin has an Ethiopian uh, great grandfather has also contributed a lot for the Russian literature to, to have a good audience here in Ethiopia. Even as I said earlier on, even during the APRDF period, you'd find some of the most important elements of actually communism and Leninism in the political sphere, even if uh, the APRDF overthrew the Dirk uh, and uh, somehow tried to show they have uh, a different type of ideology. And some of the buzzwords, including revolutionary democracy, nations and nationalities and peoples, this is a designation of actually different ethnic groups in Ethiopia. Uh, and the party structure itself, all the way from the Politburo, uh, the Central Committee, uh, and the Congress, and also the kind of uh, political arrangement, which was called democratic centralism, where you can have discussions only confined within actually the, 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 party, the, the party meeting, shows you some of the tenets of Marxism and Leninism have also continued beyond 1991, at least up until 2018, uh, since the, until the ascent of actually Prime Minister Abiy to power. And the third element which I deem is important is also armed cell uh, and military cooperation. As I said earlier on, uh, the two countries have established an official relationship in 1890, uh, uh, in, uh, but 
there was, as I said, actually there was back, there was up and down in the relationship. And as part of the start of the relationship, Russia provided Ethiopia some mountain guns, which was used in the Battle of Adwa in, 19, in uh, 1894. So, and that has also continued uh, throughout, uh, throughout the following years, and which was also uh, particularly needs to be emphasized is the Ogaden War, uh, the war between Ethiopia and Somalia from 1977 to 1978, where USSR have been extensively supporting Ethiopia together with <clears throat> other socialist countries, including Cuba, uh, Southern Yemen, and partly also North Korea. So in that period from 1977 uh, to all the way to 1990, figures showed that actually Russia provided nearly $11 billion uh, worth of uh, ammunition uh, as part of military cooperation which enabled uh, the Zen region, uh, the military junta, to establish uh, the, the number one uh, military in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, this type of relationship have continued uh, after 1991, and recently Russia has written off uh, nearly $4 billion that Ethiopia indebted from the USSR. So even if actually the EPRDF came to power, the military cooperation continued uh, at times actually at the expense of actually other type of relationship, be it cultural, scientific, uh, and economic. And uh, some, officials, uh, some official figures suggest that between 1991 to 2018, Ethiopia purchased millions of dollars worth uh, ammunition from Russia, and in particular, during the Ethiopia Eritrea War in 1998 to 2000, the military cooperation had been strengthened a lot. In 2018, uh, the two countries have signed agreements for military cooperation, uh, and uh, only uh, nearly uh, in the last couple of months, which is uh, late November, Russia delivered some air defense missiles uh, as part of the cooperation uh, between the two countries. They have also, the two countries have also agreed to cooperate on peace, peaceful uh, nuclear force, which, is, which was, uh, this was in 2019. And the fourth element, uh, which is extremely crucial, as I said, to understand the bilateral relationship is the role of Orthodox Church uh, within the states and within, also within, within the society. Uh, as you know, Ethiopia is pretty much an outlier uh, in this region. Uh, it is neither, uh, the region is actually dominated by either uh, predominantly Muslim countries uh, and Catholic and Protestantism, uh, you'd find uh, when you go down uh, to the Horn of Africa, from the Horn of Africa. But Ethiopia is an outlier. Uh, it's probably the only uh, Orthodox Christian country plus uh, together with Eritrea. So, and, and most important re religion played an important role, uh, as I said, in the state building and nation building process. And uh, Orthodox Christianity in Ethiopia had an important role within the state, particularly uh, until 1974. And the relationship between the two countries have also an element of uh, exchange of visits by the two countries, patriarchs and uh, the Orthodox Church leadership. Uh, and the last meeting by the Russian Orthodox Church patriarch has also involved meetings with, with senior government officials. And that was also true when the Ethiopian uh, Orthodox Church patriarch visited Moscow in 2018. More than half of the Russian population uh, defined themselves uh, as Orthodox Christians, and pretty much uh, more than 44% of uh, Ethiopians also identify themselves as Orthodox Christians. All in all, throughout these years, uh, the two countries have enjoyed uh, an amicable relationship, uh, despite, as I said, actually, uh, leadership uh, now and then. Uh, and uh, Probably let me stop my brief uh, comment here and let me, let me come back actually if there are any questions, comments and the likes. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Abel. So uh, we have uh, a number of audience questions coming in. I wanna encourage anyone else who wants to ask to go ahead 
uh, and email Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, tweet at Kenan Institute, or post on our Facebook page, uh, and I will make sure to, to ask those questions and credit them to you. Um, I, I, I want to start, if I can, with a question for both of you um, that uh, sort of jumps off from the, the Russia-Africa summit, uh, the fact that obviously, uh, you know, the United States uh, and China uh, pursue a variety of interests. Um, you know, some some of those were touched on in terms of uh, in terms of Russia already, but it won't surprise you, Mike, and I suspect Abel, you've heard the term as well. There's a kind of preoccupation in Washington now with great power competition, and uh, the the great powers uh, in vogue would be the United States, Russia, and China. So I, I guess the way I want to frame the question for both of you is, you know, one, to what extent uh, does Ethiopia find itself uh, engaged in, in that equation uh, as among those three powers, or perhaps there are others? Um, and, and if Ethiopia uh, finds itself in that situation, I, I guess the way I'd phrase the question is, who is driving the agenda? Uh, you know, do you see the kind of classical outsiders coming in and engaging in fights for influence, fights for control, or is there much more of a give and take with a local agenda that pulls outside resources in? Uh, and in particular, in the case of Russia, I think that'd be very interesting. So I hope that question makes sense. Um, who, who'd like to start on that? I'll start on that. Um, Definitely, we've seen uh, an emergence, you know, with, with China's emergence and Russia's emergence in Africa, um, also with what many people see as a bit of a step back by the United States in recent years, uh, there has been a lot more attention paid to great power competition uh, in, on the continent of Africa. But I would also point out that it's, it's, it's more than just the great powers. There's a lot of middle powers that have increasingly increased their role in Africa, particularly in the Horn of Africa, the Red Sea region. Uh, we've seen a growing role um, played by Turkey. Uh, we've seen a growing role played by several of the Gulf countries, a uh, growing role um, by India. Of course, the EU continues to have a role. So there, there's an increasing number of, of players in Africa and obviously there's both pros and cons. There's both challenges and opportunities for the African countries. And in terms of who's driving the agenda, what I find is that the, the, the African countries that have um, you know, the best governance, um, the, the most stable governance um, are able to generally play these things to their advantage. Whereas the, the countries that are less stable have, have less good economic governance uh, tend to be uh, more easily taken advantage of and fall into a great uh, deal of debt. Um, one country I'll mention in the Horn of Africa that I think has, has played it very well is Djibouti. Uh, Djibouti is strategically located um, on that corridor that goes from the Suez Canal uh, uh, through the Red Sea and into the Indian Ocean. And um, Djibouti has leveraged uh, the strategic interest in its um, uh, naval base to, to great advantage to itself. Um, and so that, that's one example of, of um, how these countries uh, uh, can, you know, if, if they play it right, they can, they can use these relationships to its advantage. On the other hand, you, there's a long list of African countries that have found themselves uh, uh, fallen into a, a great deal of debt by, by taking on commitments that they probably uh, should have thought better of. Um, I'd like to hand off now to Abel, and I hope Abel that in addressing this question, you can also talk a little bit about um, the um, the issue of the the Greater Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and how that is uh, the involvement of the U.S. and and potentially Russia in that issue, how that is playing um, either to the advantage or disadvantage of of Ethiopia and Egypt. So Abel, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think that's an interesting question, Matt. Uh, let me speak about Ethiopia specifically in this case. Uh, in the last nearly 30 years, Ethiopia managed to navigate through uh, the, two, the, the three countries, uh, but most importantly between uh, the West and China uh, without disappointing anyone, but uh, having uh, an excellent relationship with, with the three countries, uh, but most importantly with China and the West. 
and uh, Ethiopia remained one of China's also uh, stable, important partners, even if without having a, without being a resource-rich country. Uh, unlike many uh, many African countries, China has a strong relationship with. So I think that comes with uh, with uh, with the fact that Ethiopia is endowed with uh, with a strategic advantage, actually being situated in an important uh, position within the conflict uh, prone Horn of Africa region, and particularly up until recently being serving as actually one of the most pacifying uh, factor uh, in the region. So uh, the fact that it's situated uh, near to uh, near to the near to the, the sea that has actually uh, billions of worth trade is passing through. Uh, and the fact that actually it's near to Djibouti and also uh, being surrounded uh, and it being strategically located in this uh, area, I think made it uh, an important uh, ally uh, for many for many countries in the in the world. But particularly these three important uh, powers: uh, China, Russia, and the U.S. So, as uh, Michael has. Uh, clearly elaborated. Uh, Russia is actually warming up uh, its relationship with many countries in Africa. Recently, uh, the Central African Republic is a case to be mentioned, but uh, there are also several other countries that have signed uh, some sort of agreements with Russia, mostly military uh, cooperation. So, uh, and particularly when, with, with regards to Ethiopia, whenever Ethiopia is having some problematic relationship uh, with the West uh, that uh, that might be actually with uh, domestic policies, human rights issues and the like, uh, Russia has always been uh, an option basically. So the fact that uh, Ethiopia managed to navigate through uh, these all important powers uh, without being implicated actually, uh, without being too much siding with one or the other needs to be noted, but its geopolitical advantage is also, I think, needs to be emphasized in this regard. Let me uh, follow up, if I can, on that with a question uh, from D.E. Teodoru, who uh, asks specifically about Russia and China competition. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's obvious that China has the resources to pour into infrastructure projects, much less so the case with Russia. But do you see kind of a, a, a competition between kind of historical ties, maybe stronger institutional uh, and, and cultural links uh, with Russia, but then just sort of the sheer financial weight of China uh, attractive? And is there any sense in which that's a zero sum or do they occupy a comfortable condominium? The line was breaking, Matt. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. So the, the question is just whether there's kind of a zero sum competition uh, as between Russia and China uh, for influence, for projects, uh, for kind of the state of, of diplomatic ties or the two kind of comfortably coexist. That's it's a, it's a competition that we've seen in other areas. Um, I'm not familiar with it in Africa, in the Horn of Africa region. Probably let me uh, say a couple of things uh, about Ethiopia and probably Michael uh, can, can, can add actually uh, for, for Africa. Uh, in Ethiopia, Russia's relationship was largely confined on military and sometimes actually science, cultural and scientific uh, relationships. So, uh, and when you see China's, it's largely economic cooperation. Uh, so China is one of the biggest investors in Ethiopia. Uh, it built uh, several large scale uh, infrastructures, bridges, stadiums, hospitals and the likes. Actually, that was pretty much the case everywhere in the world, but particularly in Africa. Uh, but you don't see its, uh, its clear visibility when it comes to the political sphere or the military circle, basically. Even if uh, EPRDF, uh, the, this is actually the former ruling party in Ethiopia until uh, 2019, 2018, and the Communist Party of China enjoyed an excellent relationship 
both countries used to invite each other for uh, the party senior leadership meetings and the likes. But as it is the case actually for many parts, <clears throat> countries in Africa, China was pretty much interested about the economic cooperation uh, and the likes. When it comes to Russia, that was not pretty much the case. So there was no pretty much there was no there was no ground for competition between the two countries uh, because they were engaging in a very different sectors, and most importantly, Ethiopia retained its uh, important uh, relationship with its traditional partners with the West, even if there were occasional differences when it comes to human rights issues, liberalization, and the likes. So I think that is the thing that I need, I was trying to emphasize earlier on. Ethiopia knew how to use all the three powers in different sectors in a way that will that, that can make actually uh, the best out of it. So uh, Russia was there always actually when it comes to uh, military uh, affairs, China for largely economy, uh, and the West was taking pretty much uh, the rest of it. So. I think uh, that was the case, and it, it cleverly managed uh, to get the best out of it from the relationship without having uh, disappointing one of the partners in this regard. Mike, do you want to jump in as well? Yes, um, I, I don't see a great deal of direct competition between China and Russia uh, in Africa. Uh, Russia is certainly more, much more involved militarily than China is, and then Russia also has, I think, a strong comparative advantage in the energy sector. So you see a lot of Russian activity in the oil, gas, natural resource sector, and then pretty much everything else that's outside of the energy sector and outside of military. I, th I think Russia has largely ceded the field to the, to the Chinese. Um, the only specific example I can think of direct competition would be, uh, I'll mention Djibouti again, uh, China was able to secure uh, uh, a naval base there, and I'm sure that is something that, that Russia very much covets having something of its own there. But other than that, I think for, there, there's plenty of room for both of those two powers to operate fairly freely across Africa without stepping on each other's toes too much. Uh, about. Uh... I, I'm, I'm a little worried we, we lost your image for a second there, so I hope you can hear me, but um, let's, let's pivot a little. We have a number of questions that have come in uh, around issues of attitudes, uh, history, soft power questions. So uh, Marshall Miller asks, um, uh, does Ethiopia's past with communism affect present day Ethiopian attitudes towards Russia? Obviously you talked a little bit about the past, uh, Abel, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, if you can address the perception side of that equation. And the example, Mike, will be familiar with this, uh, that I'm thinking of is, of course, people, older generations in countries that were either occupied by the Soviet Union or strongly influenced by the Soviet Union often have markedly different attitudes than post-1991 generations. I'm curious if you see that and just in general what the attitudes are among people. For me, uh, you see it largely in the political sphere than actually within the public. Uh, the, in the political sphere, still elements of Marxism, uh, communism, and the likes are extremely visible, uh, regardless of the changes that we've, we've seen uh, in 1991. So the fighting was at that time between a Marxist uh, or socialist government and uh, rebel groups who deem themselves are true Marxists and Leninists. So there was pretty much no alternative ideology, uh, both between the government and its opposition at the time. So TPLF, uh, which was a dominant figure within EPR, they have had uh, long-standing conviction for, for this ideology. And even if actually the Cold War heralded the end of uh, communism as one of the most dominant ideologies in the world, some of the elements continued in, in the political sphere in Ethiopia. The things that I mentioned earlier on, uh, and even the flags that you're seeing uh, in, in TPLF's regional flag, uh, the Red Star and the Lax, are 
manifestations of that deeply ingrained uh, political conviction to this ideology. Uh, and the political structures, as I mentioned, uh, even if EPRDF doesn't identify itself as a uh, communist party, but the fact that it's structured as Politburo Central Committee, uh, democratic centralism, revolutionary democracy kind of buzzwords. And even the designation of, as I said earlier on, nations and nationalities and people, which doesn't, which doesn't, which is not yet clear actually for many people, which groups do belong nations, uh, nationalities and people were, were a manifestations of actually the, the, the continuation of communism beyond uh, beyond the end of uh, Cold War. But in terms of the public, I think you don't see it much. Uh, yes, uh, for the older generation. Yes, for the literature that is dominating uh, the current idea, particularly uh, in local language. But in the, in the, in the public sphere, uh, you don't see it much. But, with regards to the political parties, regardless of the ruling party or the opposition party, you see some element of uh, communism everywhere uh, in the political sphere. Mike, did you want to add to that? No. Let me Thanks. actually, there, there's a good follow up on that uh, from Lauren Laskowski, um, who asks, uh, you know, we've seen Russia use uh, propaganda and disinformation uh, in recent years as a low cost way to achieve their goals uh, on the on the African continent and sway opinions. Um, obviously, we we in the United States, uh, you in Europe, but no doubt have been very conscious of uh, Russian broadcasting, social media, all of it. Is that is that a factor in Ethiopia? And if I can add in particular, um, I am not familiar with kind of um, uh, public attitudes towards um, what we have come to call kind of fake news and conspiracy theory thinking. Um, is that something that the Russians, if they're doing this broadcasting effort, are they exploiting that sort of conspiracies about the real truth that's going on and scandals and things like that? Uh, to be honest, uh, I personally don't see it much. Uh, probably that is the case in many parts of the in many parts of the world, particularly in Europe uh, and the US. Uh, I, and I see it on the news. There is a growing concern uh, about uh, disinformation uh, and some sort of manipulation of public opinion and the likes, but. As I said earlier on, Ethiopia is also an outlier in many things, an outlier in terms of religion, an outlier in terms of culture, uh, history and the likes, and in terms of language as well. So uh, Ethiopia uses uh, a local language as a working language for the political uh, designation. Uh, we don't call it uh, an official language but it's a working language of the government and you have more than 70 uh, local language that's been used throughout the country so probably the language factor have contributed to this effect and or any other reasons uh, but uh, you don't see it much uh, and uh, the relationship particularly the historical relationship between the two countries uh, the fact that uh, they are uh, predominantly Orthodox Church, the, the role of Orthodox Church in the state and society, and the fact that uh, the relationship started in early, as early as uh, uh, 18th century uh, have contributed a lot for at least the societal relationship. And for many people, uh, the fact that uh, Russia was there uh, when Ethiopia is having some sort of uh, uh, not so good relationship with the neighboring countries is largely acknowledged. A case point is basically the, the, the war with Somalia in 1977. So Ethiopia lost pretty much, it lost the war and uh, Somalia managed to capture uh, nearly 90% of the disputed territory. And had it not been, 
for the generous support of USSR and uh, also, as I said, uh, Cuba and uh, Southern Yemen at the time. It was very difficult for the nascent socialist government to reverse uh, and manage to gain uh, all the lands uh, uh, and uh, to, to, to restore Ethiopia's territorial integrity. And the fact that Russia provided uh, that ammunition that was used uh, in Adwa has also been heavily acknowledged by the intelligentsia circle. So I think when many people think about Russia, uh, the first thing that comes to their mind is uh, the things that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, unlike probably uh, what is the case now uh, in Europe and in the US and uh, and it has many things to do with uh, the competition. Uh, it has many things to do with uh, the past relationship and the likes. So uh, you don't see, you, you, you cannot find a time where Russia and Ethiopia are having a very terrible relationship. The worst possible, the, the worst thing that could happen is actually uh, they don't talk much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't see it that way. Probably others might have a different opinion, but I don't see it that way. Abel, when we when we spoke before uh, the event, uh, you made the very valid point that the, the Tigray conflict would be an event unto itself. But we do have, I think, a, a fairly pointed question that's worth raising um, from uh, Rodney uh, Kazibwe, who's a legislative aide in Senator Schumer's office. Uh, the majority leader, and, and he asks, um, is there any pressure on Moscow to intervene in the current conflict? Uh, perhaps not for humanitarian reasons, but because the violence is escalating and further destabilizing the economy, which could jeopardize Russia's energy investments. Is that something that you've seen? Uh, one thing that is true is uh, there is, uh, a recent uh, uh, trips, a couple of trips uh, and uh, conversations between uh, Ethiopian and Russian leaders. Uh, so uh, in the last three weeks alone, there was a delegation, a business delegation uh, from Moscow that had uh, numerous meetings in Ethiopia. And uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the two foreign ministers have exchanged views uh, on how Russia can help the situation in Tigray to stabilize. So as I said earlier on as well, wherever Ethiopia is having some difficult relationship with the West, Russia has always been there uh, to support. Uh, and this is obviously actually can be seen in different ways. Uh, for some, uh, it's an alternative when uh, Ethiopia is not uh, getting what it wants uh, from the West, but for others, it's a typical authoritarian regime, uh, what expected from, from one government who's having a difficult relationship with uh, a bad or terrible uh, human rights credential. So it depends on how you see it, uh, but there is a clear, warming up relationship in the last couple of weeks that you see uh, on Ethiopia's medias. Uh, the way uh, the, relation, the discussions between the two foreign ministers have been reported in different state media shows you uh, that there is an interest, at least from the Ethiopia side, to consider uh, Russia uh, as, an, as an alternative uh, if uh, the Tigray crisis is going to worsen its relationship with the West uh, uh, and with its traditional partners in general. Uh, let, me not, let me not delve too much into uh, what's going on uh, in Tigray because it, it deserves uh, a whole a new discussion uh, exclusively on this topic. Uh, but uh, you can say that whether that is a manifestation of Ethiopia is changing hearts uh, and seeing towards Russia uh with the uh, mounting pressure against the government uh, when reporters horrific reports are coming out uh, from Tigray uh, or is it a renewal of a traditional relationship it has with Moscow is something to be seen uh, 
but there are some indications uh, that the two countries are <clears throat> somehow uh, revamping the relationship. Uh, and that is pretty much apparent if you see the state media, particularly in Ethiopia. Yeah, Abel, this, I mean, uh, it, it's a really great point because it speaks to, uh, I think, a phenomenon that we see, if not globally, at least in more than a handful of regions, uh, which is that uh, whether it's Russia or China or the United States or Europe, uh, you find kind of major global powers developing um, a kind of lane, right, an area of uh, specialization or greatest appeal. Uh, and, and that lane for Russia, um, you know, obviously it's energy, uh, obviously it's military sales, but almost um, conceptually, it is uh, a, a partner you can turn to when you have been condemned by the kind of human rights obsessed and democracy obsessed West, the United States, Europe, et cetera. So it's interesting to hear this case as a potential example, although there's, there's obviously a lot of detail to it. And as you say, the history is very important. Uh, a quick question here from Claudia Fratelli uh, at the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Claudia asks, uh, what's the nature of current academic uh, collaboration among Ethiopian and Russian universities, if there is any? You know, uh, I would add to this, Russia has made a huge push to try to re-internationalize its higher education. During Soviet times, of course, it was very international the famous Lumumba University uh, in Moscow, and then it really took a nosedive in the 1990s. So I'm, I'm curious what the state of that is as well. Uh, I'm not an expert on that aspect, uh, and I have little information. <clears throat> but I think uh, the things that you see uh, from the media, uh, there were uh, an increasing collaboration between higher institutions between Ethiopia and Russian investors. And at the moment, <clears throat> the Ethiopian Foreign Ministry uh, information page suggests that uh, nearly 300 Ethiopians uh, study, government sponsored uh, Ethiopians study in different universities in Russia. This is part of uh, government to government collaboration. So uh, I think one can imagine actually uh, there could, the, the, at least there will be uh, more than a thousand Ethiopians who are currently studying in Russia, but there is a clear interest from both sides to expand the relationship uh, to other areas, uh, not only uh, military and scientific, but also uh, to higher, edu higher education, uh, cultural and the likes. In 2019, the two countries have signed an agreement for peaceful nuclear use. Uh, uh, and that is also another area that they want to collaborate, basically. Uh, so there is, of course, uh, an interest from both sides uh, to, 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 to explore how uh, they can revamp the relationship. And this, is, will, this will be important, uh, particularly for Ethiopia, as it's having a uh, problematic relationship uh, with its uh, traditional partners in the West, particularly after the Tigray crisis. And, uh, uh, and I think it's, it, it, it's also the same uh, in some level to Russia, uh, particularly uh, in recent years with, that, with lots of allegations are coming out, uh, election related issues, uh, misinformation, fake news and the like. So uh, this exploration of uh, expanding and increasing relationship between the two countries uh, is to be seen actually where it will end up. Uh, is it temporary uh, thing? Uh, because they are, they both stressed uh, by pressures, uh, particularly from the West, uh, or this is something that would yield a long and sustainable <clears throat> bilateral relationship is something to be seen. And I think uh, it's too early to speculate anything uh, on that. Uh, I, I want to bring Mike into the conversation, so I'll, I'll come to both of you with this question, but Mike, First, um, Daniel Kenyon from the U.S. military asks, uh, what are the primary actions the U.S. can conduct 
to be a preferred military, economic, and political partner rather than uh, China, Russia, or others. Uh, and I think uh, it'd be fair to sort of regionalize the question maybe to the Horn of Africa or, or other parts of Africa, but Ethiopia in specific. Mike, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. I mean, the main thing will be to uh, be present, be engaged uh, at all levels, but up to and including the highest levels. Um, there's really been a, a dearth of, of personal engagement um, uh, by U.S. diplomats and leaders at the highest level in recent years in Africa. And, and that over time, that makes a difference. You can get away with that maybe in any given year or two. But when it when it goes over too many years, um, it, it begins to uh, uh, to um, uh, undercut our, our other diplomatic efforts. Um, the other thing is just to 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 play to our strengths as a country and a, a, as a great power, which is um, uh, standing up for democratic good governance, standing up for rule of law. Uh, those are the trend lines of, of where uh, most Africans want to go, although there's, you know, there's still a, a number of countries that, that have poor records in that regard. But if you were to, to pull across the entire African continent, um, th these countries, uh, the, they want to go forward on rule of law, they want to go forward on good governance. Um, and uh, uh, they look to, uh, especially civil society organizations, they, they definitely look much more to, to the US than they do to the, the Chinese or the Russians for, for forward progress. Um, obviously dealing with, with the, dealing with COVID-19 today and also dealing with the economic repercussions of, of post-COVID-19 is another area where I think America, the United States has a comparative advantage that, that we can work uh, uh, with Africa on. Um, in terms of uh, uh, working with a lot of the new innovation in Africa, whether it's in the um, uh, the, the IT sector or uh, uh, or the energy sector, there there's a lot of areas where again the U.S. has a comparative advantage, and um, there's great opportunities uh, for working directly with Africa. Um, so I would say that's that's what uh, those three things are where the United States can can really play its cards the best is one is per, increase the personal high level engagement uh, to uh, continue to push forward with um, civil society organizations um, on rule of law on democratic governance good economic governance and then uh, working very closely with Africa to uh, help it navigate the COVID-19 crisis and the, um, the great economic challenges that are gonna follow the, um, the immediate post-COVID environment. Hey, Mike, bef before I go to Abel on that, uh, do you see any objective indicators already that the Biden uh, State Department, or the Blinken State Department, the Biden administration is doing anything concretely different uh, or more than was the case before? It's still early days. I think we need to see more, more of the top level officials confirmed and in place, but certainly the, uh, the early rhetoric that we've seen, including President Biden's um, statements uh, uh, in advance of the, um, the upcoming AU summit, it makes it clear that uh, we are gonna see a greater priority than we have in recent years on, on the Africa relationship. So uh, th th there's a lot, uh, I think expectations are, 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 are going up and, and for good reason. Great, thanks, Abel, please. Uh, thank you. I think, in my opinion, the, the U.S. needs to re-engage uh, Africa and African countries in general. So I, I know this is a very uh, difficult thing to say, uh, but uh, the last four years of Trump administration uh, was probably uh, the time where the relationship between uh, the US and uh, many African countries have hit, have, have, have re hit rock bottom. Uh, and uh, the remarks uh, about African countries and the understaffed uh, State Department and the likes were manifestations of actually the US was not properly engaging Africa and African countries. I, I think uh, so few signs that we've seen, uh, as uh, Mike have also said, actually, uh, in Biden's remark to the Africa Union Summit, suggests that there is a clear interest to re-engage Africa uh, in a much more coordinated uh, and organized way. And in that, I think there is a huge deal of expertise in Washington, D.C., uh, to understand uh, Africa, uh, the problems, the opportunities, and the likes, way more than actually what we're having in Beijing 
or in Moscow. So I think the fact that uh, the US started to re-engage Africa would uh, make it would make it actually an important partner uh, uh, in this continent. And uh, the things that we've seen, as I said earlier, on, are promising. Uh, and lots of uh, Africa experts uh, are coming back to the Biden administration, who were uh, with the Obama administration. I truly hope uh, Africa will get a much uh, uh, increased emphasis vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Trump administration. And I think the US will continue to play <clears throat> its important and strategic role uh, uh, as a stabilizing factor in supporting the economic developments uh, and the democratic realms of many African countries and its citizens. Uh, forgive me, Abel, if you already mentioned this, but I certainly missed it. Did, is Ethiopia getting um, uh, vaccine supplies from any particular uh, country or set of countries? And, and obviously, I'm curious whether Russia's much advertised Sputnik uh, vaccine has been has made its way to, to Ethiopia. To be honest with you, Matt, I have no idea about it. But uh, I know uh, the Ethiopian uh, Ministry of Health uh, is in discussions with a range of countries uh, and non-state actors, uh, but uh, I don't know uh, what their plans are and uh, where their discussion is in this regard. Uh, but there is uh, uh, there is an interest to get it, uh, whomever is supplying. Uh, uh, fastest and uh, probably with the modalities that they're having at the moment. Let me, uh, we're, we're basically out of time here. So let me invite just a final, you know, brief comment from both of you. Uh, it occurs to me that the arc of this relationship is one that underscores two pretty universal lessons in international relations. And that is that, um, you know, friendships between regimes tend to be dictated by, as you pointed out about military sales, commodity sales, you know, diplomatic convenience, providing, providing safe harbor when uh, you can't conduct relations with other countries. Um, but friendships between peoples, right, between societies depend on a different set of factors. Religion was one that you mentioned, or culture more broadly, uh, educational ties, and then kind of bigger picture, longer term development investments. Um, when, you, when you sort of take those two metrics, um, I'm curious, you know, how do you grade the Ethiopia-Russia relationship on kind of the regime, or we don't even have to call it regime, the government side, and then the kind of people to people side, because one is probably going to be more enduring than the other. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, question. <laughs> Uh, so one thing, one similarity uh, that I forgot to mention is the dominance of strongman in both countries in the post-Cold War era. Uh, Russia's Putin remains actually a dominant uh, figure uh, in Russia. And between 1991 to 2012, uh, Meles was pretty much an architect of <clears throat> most of the things uh, that have happened in recent past and that continue to happen all the way from the constitution, uh, the federation and the likes. So uh, you can also uh, bring some similarities there. Uh, but the, Russia is extremely far away, both in terms of distance uh, and in terms of visibility as well. So. China is much more visible than Russia uh, uh, in Ethiopia and probably many European, more, many small European countries as well. So in terms of people to people relationship, yes, you can draw you, examples like the, the religion uh, aspect, uh, the culture, and uh, the fact that Russia was there where Ethiopia was having uh, some sort of problems when it comes to territorial integrity. But all in all, uh, I would say uh, the people-to-people -people relationship remain cordial, uh, but the relationship between governments 
has had lots of ups and downs, depending on uh, the region that comes to Addis, in particular, speaking about Ethiopia. Uh, before 1974, Ethiopia was, was pretty much uh, siding with the West uh, when it was under the monarchy. From 1974 to 1991, um, it, 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 it referred itself as a socialist government and it was in the, so, in the socialist bloc. But from 1991 onwards, the government was navigating between uh, Russia and China depending on the situation, depending on uh, the availability of options and the likes. So uh, I don't know if that answers your, your question, uh, but uh, this is how I see it. No, that's great. Thanks very much, Mike. I'll give you a final quick word and then we'll wrap. Yeah, I, I thought Abel's answer answer really, really, really was spot on. And um, you know, in my view, uh, Ethiopia is truly uh, in the Horn of Africa and in East Africa. Ethiopia is truly a regional power that has done very well for itself in recent years, and um, that allows them to, to to pick and choose their partners as they see fit. And um, in some areas, uh, Russia will be a country that Ethiopia can and should partner with. And in other areas, it, it'll be one where uh, they can pretty much ignore Russia because there is no role. I mean, the example I can think of is, is uh, when I was in charge of our embassy in Juba uh, not too long ago, uh, dealing with the issue of, of South Sudan's uh, uh, long going civil war. Uh, Ethiopia was our primary uh, uh, partner in, in trying to solve the, the vexing dilemma of, of South Sudan's civil war. Uh, so the U.S. and Ethiopia worked together very closely on that issue. Uh, Russia simply wasn't a player whatsoever. And um, so really the bottom line is it, Ethiopia is in a position, has put itself in a good position where it can pick and choose its partners um, and, and, and work with those countries that present uh, uh, you know, something constructive that Ethiopia can, can, can gain from as it sees fit. So I think Ethiopia is in a good position uh, to, uh, to manage its relationships, whether it's with Russia, whether it's with China or it's with, uh, or with the United States. Well, let me thank you guys both very much, Abel and Mike, for your uh, excellent uh, perspectives on this. This wraps up our fifth Global Perspectives event. I thank the Africa program for their partnership on this and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon in our next. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much.